everyone. Welcome to episode 149 of the Book Cougars, Two Middle-Aged Women on the Hunt for a Good Read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. And we've been sitting here talking about food. Yes. Not going to shock anyone, I'm sure. No, we've been talking about bagels, lox and bagels. Yeah. So now I'm hungry, but Ugh. we're going to record in spite of our grumbling stomachs. <laughs> yes. And we have some thank yous. Yes, we have some new Patreon sponsors to thank. Yes, thank you, Audrey and Nicole. Thank you so much, and welcome to our Patreon community. We're happy to have you. Yes. We have a lot going on this episode, so I think we're going to jump right in. All right, so what are you currently reading, Emily? Well, speaking of hungry, (laughs) I am reading a cookbook that just came out on January 18th. It's called Savory Dinner Pies, More Than 80 Delicious Recipes from Around the World. And this is by Ken Hadrich, who wrote that book, The Pie Academy, that I was talking about last year. Mm -hmm. And basically what he says, and I wholeheartedly agree with, is that everything tastes better in pie crust. Yeah. Right? I I agree. Yes. So these are savory meat pies, vegetable pies, chicken pot pies. Mm. And he literally goes around the world. I'm still reading the introduction and looking at the pictures, which is what I typically do first. And then I'll go back and decide what recipe to start with. Okay. I have a real burning chicken pot pie question. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, this was a huge debate. Do you eat all the insides and then the crusts? Or do you eat it together? Like, do you have a certain ratio of insides and crust on your fork as you lift it into your mouth? Oh, this is my kind of burning question. I will say it depends on if it's a double crusted pie or only a crust on the top. This is not going to shock you. I'm a fan of the double crust. Oh, yeah, me too. I mean, we're, we're soulmates. Yes, we are. Yes. And back in the day when we were kids, there were those little individual pot pies, yep. which is the best because it's much more crust to filling ratio, right? Yeah. And you don't have to share. Yeah. 100%. (laughs) I like how you think. So I am a crust with each bite kind of gal. Okay. What about you? Well, when I was younger, I used to leave the crust for last, especially with the double crust because it's just so yummy. I also used to eat my pizza that way. I used to eat all the toppings off of it and then have the crust. Um, now I tend to eat them both simultaneously. Oh, interesting how yeah. you've matured in your crust eating. Is that what that is? Yes, I think so. Okay. Because you know that there'll always be more. When you're a kid, it's almost like a hoarding thing, like I might never see it again. You know what? That is quite true. I mean, that's certainly how I was with pizza. Like you had to eat fast because if you wanted to get your fair share, you know. <laughs> and now that I can afford to even buy my own pizzas, it's just kind of like I don't have that anxiety anymore. Yeah. All right. Back to the pie book here. Yeah. So anyway, more to come. I haven't cooked from it yet. I'm still in the browsing and drooling phase. (laughs) (laughs) Again, that's called Savory Dinner Pies. It's out now by Ken Hadrich. Well, I am reading War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. This is something I picked up a while ago as part of Jenny's Reading Envy Russia. It's not going as planned. Um, I'm on chapter 14, which isn't too bad. I know some people like Linda, she's reading a chapter a day. So what I did was I bought a digital copy on my e-reader because initially I was reading in the mornings in the big ass hard copy that I have. (laughs) And then school stuff got in the way. I mean, then I thought I can't read this in bed at night. So that's why I got the digital copy. And now I am reading a chapter or two at night. So I think my pacing is going to be back on track. Right on. And I am enjoying it so far. I'm in very much the character building phase of it right now. Colleen, who's also reading it, is into part two, which is where the war is starting to happen. And she said she can kind of understand now why people do get a little bogged down in certain areas. That's the one hard thing about Buddy Reads, I guess, is knowing what's ahead. But you might like that part. Who knows? Who knows, right? Yeah. I guess I also read faster on an e-reader because I'm not, I mean, I do highlight some stuff, but when I'm reading the book, I tend to really underline and Mm -hmm. make notes. And then I had that little notebook that I was writing. Uh, That's all gone by the wayside. (laughs) I was so impressed by that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That lasted like a week. (laughs) It's good to have goals. Totally. (laughs) But be flexible with them. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Well, I'm also reading Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown. I was super excited when this book came out. And then it's so beautiful. 
I was kind of leaving it on my coffee table. And finally, I was like, well, are you going to pick this thing up? Or are you just going to think about it? <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown. And what she's doing with this book is she's exploring through years of research, the different emotions that we experience. And part of why she decided this was important to write about is because when they were interviewing people and asking about their emotions and what sort of emotions they experienced, something like I can't remember the percentage, but it was a very high percentage of people said, I experience happiness, sadness, and anger. Those were the three they could identify. And she was like, oh, this is trouble because there's a lot more emotions on the emotion spectrum. So what I'm doing is taking a play out of the Chris Wolak playbook. Is that the way to say it? And I'm reading it slowly like you've been doing with some of your nonfiction reads, because she has it separated really nicely into different sections. Each section deals with a handful of emotions that go together. So it kind of makes sense to read it a section at a time. And Brene Brown is famous for her storytelling. So as she's talking about these emotions, she weaves in stories, which I love. An example would be section three is called Places We Go When Things Don't Go As Planned. And the emotions that are covered here are boredom, disappointment, expectations, regret, discouragement, resignation, and frustration. Mm. I'm really enjoying it. One of the things she recommends is that people potentially read it as a couple or read it as a family because it does give you openings for broader discussions, and also how to identify your emotions as you're experiencing them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Yeah, because so often people do just have a reaction and then they look back on it and they think I was angry Mm -hmm. or I was sad, but there's so much more depth to our emotions, right? Yeah. And then once you understand your emotions and the people around you, you can communicate to them, then they know how to react to that, right? Well, yeah, and you can also control your own emotions. Like you can have them, but not let them spray all over other people. Yes. You can say, wow, I'm feeling frustration. So maybe I need to take a break Mm -hmm. and go and breathe and think about this. Right. Instead of yelling at my dog. Right. I don't know who would ever do something like that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Uh, Again, that's called Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown. I'm definitely going to check that one out because I love learning about emotions and Mm -hmm. human interaction and human self-understanding and all that good stuff or self-understanding. I guess I could just drop the human from that. (laughs) (laughs) The other book I'm reading is for my book club and I'm listening to it on audio. It's The Woman All Spies Fear, Codebreaker Elizabeth Friedman and Her Hidden Life. It's by Amy Butler Greenfield. This just came out in 2021 And one of my book club members said that that's what she was interested in reading. And we all said, oh, yeah, that sounds good. It is about Elizabeth Friedman, who came of age just before World War I in Indiana is where she was from. Very smart woman whose dad was very controlling and very traditional and thought there was no need for women to have education. So she put herself through college with a loan from him that he charged interest on. So she had a challenge to get through, but she did secure her degree and eventually found herself at the Newberry Library in Chicago. So that, of course, made me give the book an extra star just for mentioning the Newberry Library. From there, talking with a a librarian who worked there, she got her first really cool job with a man called Colonel Fabian, who was from Chicago, but he had an estate in Geneva, Illinois. He had so much research going on there. Like he would pay these researchers to come there and he'd create facilities for them. So he hired her to work on the Shakespeare project. Elizabeth meets her future husband there and together they both become really famous, infamous, depending on what side you're on, code breakers. So I'm at the point right now, I don't know, I might be halfway through the book. I'm not sure. World War I is over and she was just contacted by the Coast Guard to help them with all the rum running that was going on during Prohibition. So that was really cool because the Coast Guard doesn't come up very often in spy-type books, at least not that I've come across yet. 
So I'm really enjoying this biography very much. Sounds super interesting. Are you reading anything else? I am. I'm reading two other books, which is very unusual for me, but I'm reading Goliath by Tochi Anyabuchi. This just came out. And this is the one I talked about on a previous episode. It's science fiction, takes place in the year 2050, and New Haven is at the heart of this book. Wow. Yeah, which is really cool. That's where he lives, the author. But it's a really tough read. He's dealing a lot with class and race. People are on a space station, but they come back down to Earth and they're trying to take over what's left and gather and kick people out. You'd want to think maybe in the future we get it right, but we don't. I was reading it and I just thought, this is so heavy. I need to just put it down for a little bit. I will come back to it. I like his writing a lot. But I went from that to Free Love (laughs) by Tessa Hadley, (laughs) which is completely different. It takes place in the 60s in London, a woman who's married with children, a young man who is the child of a family friend. He is a young man comes for dinner and all sorts of sexual energy comes to light. The writing is really brilliant. I am not a student of literature at all. Everybody who has blurbed this on the back are heavy hitters and they say things like, you know, she's an old fashioned modernist, brilliantly postmodern all at once. Like that kind those words don't mean a whole lot to me, but I can tell you it's beautiful writing and I'm really enjoying it and it's very different than what I typically read. Mm. So again, it's called Free Love by Tessa Hadley. And both of these are recent releases, Goliath and Free Love. Nice. Well, for those of you who are new to the podcast, we are located in Guilford, Connecticut, and that's just outside of New Haven, hence us getting excited about a book set in New Haven. Yes, indeed. So the other book I'm currently reading is another nonfiction. It's On the Trail of the Jackalope. How a Legend Captured the World's Imagination and Helped Us Cure Cancer. It's by Michael P. Branch. Longtime listeners will remember that name. Mike was our guest in a past episode, and he's going to be a guest in our future episode. So stay tuned for that. I'm loving the book. I think it is so well written, and it's so fascinating. He takes you through so many different avenues, like there's some tourism history, science, folklore, and I'm not even through the book. Yeah, it's so good. I finished it. I really was planning to give it a heavy browse, and I opened it up and could not put it down. I literally read it in two days. The whole rest of my life went away. It was (laughs) so good. He's such a great writer. Yeah, so this one comes out March 1st, so pre-order it now or ask your library to get a copy It's On the Trail of the Jackalope by Mike P. Branch. Yes, and he will be our guest on the next episode, episode 150. So what did you just read, Chris? Well, I finally finished that audiobook I had been reading for quite a long time, The Possessed, Adventures with Russian Books and the People Who Read Them by Elif Bautuman. That was one that Jenny had chosen as a read-along for Reading in Russia. I can say I'm glad I read it. I mean, to say you regret reading a book is a rare thing. Yeah, because you don't know like six months from now, something might happen to be like, oh, I remember that from when I read this book. Right. right. Yeah, you never know. Way. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's more about her graduate school experience, how she got interested in studying Russian lit and other types of literature. She spends a lot of time in Uzbekistan. And I felt like that section really kind of dragged for a while. But overall, I enjoyed it. The title, I thought, was very misleading. Well, I think when we were talking about this off mic over the course of your reading it, it was more of a disappointment, I felt like, that you had because it wasn't what you thought it was going to be at all. Yeah, because of the title and misrepresentation of the contents, Mm -hmm. I think. And, you know, that can be when the publicity department has a disconnect from the contents of the book and they don't market it appropriately. Right. This is definitely a memoir with a lot of literature stuff thrown in, from anecdotes of authors' lives to how academics behave at conferences and interact with one another, what it's the passion of being a graduate student when you study and read all the time, and then you stay up until four in the morning talking with friends about literature. Yeah. So in that regard, it was very interesting, and I enjoyed it. 
But I, I do think the title and maybe some of the description was a little misleading. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I finished a book called The Swimmers that I adored. This book is coming out on 2-22-22, the coolest pub date ever, totally. right? <laughs> this is by Julia Atsuka. And I guess she's pretty revered. This is my first time coming across one of her books. She also published a book called When the Emperor Was Divine and the Buddha in the Attic. The Buddha in the Attic was a National Book Award finalist in 2011. This book is about a group of people who are avid swimmers in a local pool. The beginning of the book is all told from the vantage point of we, kind of as this we of this group of people swimming in a pool. I'm an avid swimmer, and I've had different times in my life where I have gone to the same swimming pool, and there really is a community of people who you come into contact with at the pool and you get to know them and their weird swimming quirks and what they wear that can be weird and the different ways that they count their laps can be really interesting. The pool that I used to swim at at Antioch College, there was an 80-year-old man that would start every swim by walking in and jumping off the diving board. And I just loved seeing him do that. So the very beginning of the book is all about that. And if you are a swimmer, you will just absolutely adore that part of the book. But then about 40% in, a crack develops in the bottom of the pool. And everyone in the pool, of course, is fascinated by this crack and talking about it. Eventually, they have to shut the pool down. And then the book completely morphs to be from the perspective of the daughter of one of the swimmers. Mm. And is about her mother now in a memory care facility. Oh, boy. So the crack in the pool kind of is a metaphor for illness, life, things like that. Brilliant book. There's also a little thread about Japanese internment camps. Because Julia Oteca, it's somewhat autobiographical, semi-autobiographical about her own relationship with her mother and her family's heritage. I loved this book so much. I highly recommend it. Again, it's not out until February 22nd, but that's right around the corner. Very cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Another book that I read since the last time we talked is You Should Have Left by Daniel Kelman. This was translated from the German by Ross Benjamin. This is a book I picked up at the House of Books in Kent. I was almost going to say... House of Kent. <laughs> House of Books in Kent. It's a thin volume. It's a thin novel. Probably, you know, novella length. It was in their horror section. And I was attracted to it because it was small, short. And sometimes it's really good in a horror novel. I think of The Haunting of Hill House as being in that category. So you should have left. It's about a guy who's a screenwriter. And he and his wife and their small daughter have rented this house up in the mountains. There's no one else around. There's only one road to get to this house. And pretty soon, weird things start happening. The cover of the book that I have, it's showing a picture in strips, uh, horizontal strips that are really distorted. And the original cover has a picture of a triangle that's off and open on one end. So... This is the short little review I did on Goodreads. I just wrote, short, creepy, and weird. Is the house haunted or is the man haunted? What's going on? It's like Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House and Stephen King's The Shining merged, mutated, and then that product was edited by Hemingway when he was very, very drunk. <laughs> so <laughs> That's a great review. I mean, it is a really weird little novel. You know, it's one of those that while I was reading, I was like, oh, come on. And I was like, ooh, really? <laughs> you know, like almost at the same time. Yeah. Um, and it, there was actually a movie made out of this. So the book came out in 2016. The English translation is copyrighted 2017. The edition I have is a vintage books that came out in 2018. But in 2020, there was a movie that came out starring Kevin Bacon and Amanda Siegfried. And I watched the preview and there are some similarities, but some big differences because Hollywood, mm -hmm. they do things differently. But I'm going to watch the movie if I can find it streaming somewhere. 
if you like horror and you like psychological horror, this would be something you might want to check out. I did enjoy it. And I don't want to say too much. So again, that's You Should Have Left by Daniel Kalman. I finished reading Furia by Yamil Saeed Mendez. This is a YA novel. We got a copy from Algonquin Young Readers. Thank you. This was the perfect weekend winter read for me. It's very much about female empowerment, which I just love. This is what they call an own voices novel. So the author is from Rosaria, Argentina, and this is definitely a love story to her home. I watched a very brief little two minute clip that she did about what her book's about. And she immigrated to the United States when she was 19. Mm -hmm. And then started on her journey to become a writer and was always told, write about what you know and what you love. So she wrote about her home, Rosaria, Argentina, which is the home of Lionel Messi, one of the most famous football slash soccer players in the world. And so she is a huge football fan. This book is all about a young woman who lives in a house with some domestic violence and some very certain feelings about what a young woman should do with her life, and also two parents who are living unfulfilled lives. The protagonist, Camila, is a fantastic soccer player, and she wants to play soccer. So she starts playing in secret for a club, and nobody cares about women's soccer there, so she can kind of get away with it. It's believable. And her family just thinks she's off at school and studying with friends and whatnot, but she's on her way to being a fantastic football star. There's also definitely a thread about female violence and kind of charting your own course as a woman when the world you're living in isn't seeking that course for you. There's also a little love story. And the love story is that her boyfriend is a very famous footballer already and doesn't necessarily see the value of her seeking her own dreams. Mm. So she really stands her ground, which I appreciate. The writing was lovely. There's also a lot of Argentinian culture and food, which I really appreciated as well. I definitely enjoyed it as an adult, but if you have a young woman in your life that you're looking for a gift, highly recommend. Very cool. Again, it's called Furia by Yamil Saeed Mendez. Nice. Well, I read two more kids books. I've been on this picture book kick this year so far. So I picked up Good Night Moon by Margaret Wise Brown. That came out in 1947, and I've read it many times before. I was inspired to pick it up again because there was an article in The New Yorker that my sister-in-law forwarded to me, The Radical Woman Behind Good Night Moon. This article is by Anna Holmes. It talked about Brown's life and her children's book writing and relationships and things like that. So... I read Good Night Moon and really enjoyed it. And then I thought, what other classic kids' books are out there? Because I, I don't feel like I grew up reading a lot of the classic kids' books. All of the things that I read were like hand me downs for my sister, and they weren't things like Good Night Moon. So when I first started working at Borders, I would read kids' books, occasionally picture books, because for one, this is a dirty little secret, but a lot of booksellers are terrified of the children's section. <laughs> You know, yeah. Um, I so, can see that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to help kind of help me with that, and then also just to kind of stay current with things. Like I would always try and read books that people were buying a lot or regularly recommending and things like that. So I one day read Harold and the Purple Crayon. This is by Crockett Johnson. It came out in 1955, and I didn't like it. So many people would recommend it. Oh, you have to read it. And uh, <laughs> so it's this little okay. boy, Harold, who has a purple crayon. It's all line drawings okay. of things he gets into. And he gets himself out of them by drawing pictures. A coworker saw me reading it. And he's like, oh, so what'd you think? I said, yeah, I didn't really like it. He's like, yeah, Harold's an asshole. <laughs> and we laughed and we kind of moved on with our day. But I thought about that interaction. I thought, I wish we would have talked about it because I would have liked to have known why he said that. And so I reread Harold and the Purple Crayon, and I didn't like it again. And I think one of the reasons I don't like it is that there's no struggle. Like Harold has this magic crayon. He gets whatever he wants. Like he has no consequences for his actions. And he was born with this magic purple crayon in his hand. 
And even his facial features don't change really that much. So it's kind of creepy as well. Hmm. Yeah. So I know it's supposed to be depicting imagination. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people love this book. Well, if I could just interject, it could be that it's time for an updated version of Harold and the Purple Crayon. I don't know. I haven't opened it in a long time. I can tell you as a parent, there was a point in my life where I could recite Goodnight Moon in my sleep, literally for about five years of my life, because I read it so much. My kids love that book. Harold and the Purple Crayon to me was like, what the hell do you want me to do with this book? <laughs> like, There are educators out there right now that are rolling their eyes at us. I'm sure that this book is very important in the world of children's literature, but I had a hard time with Harold and the Purple Crayon as well. Oh, okay. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I mean, it's really, you know, creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I just thought like as in, in terms of story, mm -hmm. you want to see a character go through stuff and struggle with stuff and not just have a magic crayon that solves everything. Well, and I suspect it's one of those books that its sweet spot is that it's on a kid's shelf and they pick it up and they look at it and imagine their own things in their own world. I don't know. I mean, I never enjoyed reading it yeah. myself. As a child, I don't remember enjoying it and I didn't enjoy it with my kids. Good Night Moon, on the other hand, I could read that every night. Yeah. I love that it's book. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. I actually read it twice, yeah. like a couple different nights last week. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, that's all for me. Well, no, we had a buddy read. A buddy listen. Oh, my God. We're going to talk about that now. Awesome. Sure. Yes. yes. We read a book by Bianca Murray. We listened, I should listened, say, yeah. to a book by Bianca Murray called The Prin Viper. Bianca's going to be on at the end of this episode to talk more about this book. What a listen. Yeah, totally awesome. And this is an Audible original. So you do have to have an Audible account to listen. You can get a free account for like a month trial. Mm -hmm. So if you want to, you can pursue it that way. Do you want to give a brief synopsis? Bianca does. Yeah, Bianca does. And we were so honored to find that we were the first people she was really talking with about the story. Mm -hmm. It's set in the future. The character, Naomi Prin, she's a woman on trial. And you don't really know what she's on trial for at first. There are a lot of different voices narrated by different actors, which is cool. So it's actually performed and not necessarily just read by one actor. It's performed by different actors who really bring personality to their characters. One is a young guy. It's his first trial, is it? We don't really know. If you listen, you know that it might not be. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks it's his first trial. There's an old man who is over 100 years old who remembers the day, you know, the old days when a trial meant something very different and there were different standards. And you find out more about him later and why he has a weight on his shoulders. One of the funny things about him is Bianca does have what Laura would call 12-year-old boy humor, which <laughs> I definitely have. So I do tend to think fart things can be kind of funny. And I've never heard of a fart called an air pony. Mm -mm. Have you? No. Okay. No. I got some fart knowledge from this book. Yeah, right? Yeah. So an air pony. Um, <laughs> there's him. Uh, there's another woman who is in her 50s, who is one of the jurors. And throughout the course of the story, you find out why this woman is on trial. And you find out what has been going on in society to create the conditions for this trial. There's so much futuristic stuff. There's a judge that is projected Hologram. A hologram, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the audiobook is only a couple hours. It's a short story, yeah. which is really different. And it is truly a performance. Yeah. It's really enjoyable. Highly recommend. We know Audible's tricky for some people. And for now, that is where it's available. Yeah. And Bianca talks a little bit about that as well. Yeah. And her podcast. Yeah. Um, she has a podcast called The Shit No One Tells You About Writing that uh, she does with two agents and they also have author guests on. So you'll learn a little bit more about her podcast as well. We love Bianca so much. We met her at a Booktopia event. She's been our guest on the podcast before. And she's one of those authors who's a lot of fun to follow on social media. She's very active and engaging. And I think just a fantastic person. Fantastic person and a fantastic supporter of the world of writers yeah. and books. And she's originally from South Africa 
she lives in Canada now and is a Canadian citizen with her husband. Yep. And again, that's called The Prin Viper by Bianca Murray. Listeners, a lot of times we talk about books that aren't out yet, and we're trying to come up with a way to remind you once the time has come that they've come out. We haven't quite figured it out yet, <laughs> but I did go back and just look at books that we read or talked about in the fall that are now out. We just want to remind you. So The Magnolia Palace by Fiona Davis, Small World by Jonathan Evison, Black Cake by Charmaine Wilkerson, Dead Silence by S.A. Barnes, Love and Saffron, a novel of friendship, food, and love by Kim Fay. Right. So Biblio Adventures. We want a, a joint job. Joint job. It was so fun. We masked up. We went out into the world together. We did. So we made sure we had our hand sanitizer containers filled and extra masks and everything. And we went up to Northampton Mass. We did. The first stop was noodles. For lunch. Delicious. Yes. So good. We got some ramen and some stir fried noodles. And then they had these adorable steamed buns in the shape of animals. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a hedgehog we decided with some help from (laughs) from social media. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, so good. It was so nice to eat out in public. And, you know, everyone there was masked up too. When their food came to the table, people would take their masks off and eat. So we felt pretty comfortable. Yeah. And it's a small place, which was good. And then we wandered over to Smith College to their campus. Yeah, we walked around campus and we really love the architecture. Like the, it's such a neat collection of old buildings, 19th century buildings and then some modern looking 1970s futuristic like buildings, which I guess it's no longer futuristic if it was built in the <laughs> 70s, but wow. And we went into their main campus, I think it was called Campus Center, right? Yeah, like the Student Center, and that's where the bookstore is located. But on the way to the bookstore, we stopped in this little lounge area that was really cool. They had a central fireplace with nice seating, very well lit. Like the whole one wall was glass, and it was a cold but clear day. And against one wall, they had a bunch of shelves filled with books, like a take one, leave one situation. Yeah, it was really cool. It was as if there was like a little beacon that was beeping and we turned our heads and went right for it. That was our first stop. Yeah. (laughs) And then we went down to the bookstore, which is in the basement of the building. And they actually had textbooks there. So we wandered and had so much fun looking at all the books. Yeah, we hit every row of books. And some colleges don't have textbooks in the bookstores anymore, like Mount Holyoke doesn't, Mm -hmm. you know, everything's ordered online. So it's just so nice to go into a bookstore and be able to see what's being taught. Yeah. And we came across a copy of Mouse, the graphic novel, which just I think that day or the day before it had been announced that a Tennessee school board banned Mouse unanimously, a 10-0 vote. Right. Yeah, it was like World Holocaust Day. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Holocaust Remembrance Day, I think it's called. Yeah. Holocaust Remembrance Day. So we did a photo with it, recommending it highly because we both love that graphic novel. I mean, it was originally two graphic novels and now you can buy the complete mouse. We just think it's really shocking that a book like that would be banned. You know, it was already on the curriculum. So why remove it? Mm hmm. The good that comes out of that is typically when a book is banned, it makes kids just want to read it more. But what's happening in some of these situations is that librarians are getting in trouble for having these books on their shelves. And that's not okay. I kind of want to add that their time is being wasted Mm. by this. Like it's taking time away from librarians to do their job of getting new books and helping patrons with books and research and things like that. And that's, I think, sometimes I feel like that's part of the plan is to just be disruptive and put a wrench in in the system of one of the most democratic institutions in our country, which is the public library and the school library, I think. Yeah, it's a really good point. Thank Um, you for raising that. Yeah. And we love all of you librarians out there. Amen. And if there's anything else people can be doing to help, let us know and we'll spread the word. Yeah. Our buddy Jenny from Reading Envy posted something recently that I really think we both agree with, which is 
these libraries don't need you purchasing copies for them. We need people to run for local politics, run for your local school board, keep things on your local level going in the direction that feels good to you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And some good has come from this, like a comic book store in Tennessee made an announcement that they started a GoFundMe campaign people could donate to. And any kid who reached out to them in the state of Tennessee, they would send them a copy of Mouse for free. This campaign was so successful. They raised $90,000. So now they're saying any kid in the United States who wants a copy of this book, they'll send it to them. Yeah. That's so awesome. there's been strong reaction to this happening. And, you know, when we were talking to Bianca, one of the things she talked about is how important it is for people to have critical thinking skills. And that's the importance of these books. And it's what makes it feel threatening to the people who ban them, sadly. Yeah. God forbid children should have critical thinking skills. I know, right? Some of the books that are being challenged are books that are things that kids are dealing with anyway. Mm -hmm. The loss of a loved one, the suicide of a parent, rape, mm -hmm. incest, murder, drug addiction. Like Sexual kids, orientation. Yeah, kids yeah. are dealing with so much. Yeah. And to think that they're not, it's just such a disservice to them as human beings mm -hmm. to not have an outlet like that to explore and to understand that there are a lot of other people out there in the world dealing with this. And how did they deal with it? And what can you do for yourself mm -hmm. in the community that you live in to help prevent certain things? Right. And, you know, banning books is racism disguised, let's be clear, in this situation. So well, that's yeah, also that absolutely. aspect. Yeah. Because right? if you look at the books that are being challenged, it, they're almost always dealing with race or issues of human sexuality. Mm hmm so we were happy to see the book. We were happy to get a chance to touch it and take a picture of it. And then we moved on to the <laughs> Forbes Public Library. Yeah, which is right across the street. This is a public library that is just gorgeous. Love that library. I've been there a couple times before. But I don't think I was ever upstairs on their second floor where they have a gallery. I don't know if it wasn't open before or, or who knows why I was never up there. But we had a fantastic walk around the whole place. They have a great periodical section. They do. We um, totally checked out the mystery scene collection that they had there where our buddy John Valeri is a contributor to that magazine. So we saw his name flash by a couple times, which was fun. That was super fun. And then upstairs in the gallery, there was this amazing diorama from Alison Bechtel's book, Dykes to Watch Out For, of the bookstore represented in that book. Yeah. It was unbelievable. We put some pictures on social media. So check our social media if you want to see it. I don't know. We can always email you a picture if you want to see it. Right. Email us. Yeah, exactly. Maybe we'll just do a bit of a gallery when this episode goes live again, too, with some of those. But um, yeah. really wonderful public library. You can tell it's a place that the community really loves and takes care of. Yeah. And then we walked to the car and on the way to the car, we did make it to one bookstore, yes. which is called Old Bookstore. And it's downstairs, like basement level in this old brick building. And it's for sale if anyone's looking to buy a bookstore. Yeah, the guy said that his parents started it in like 57 or 58. So yeah, and he's he's ready to be done. Yeah, yeah. It was a great day. We had so much fun together. It was a cold, windy day, perfect to be doing a little gallivant. Yeah, for sure. It was great to get out and walk around too and yeah, be in the cold. Yeah, it was good. And I also just listened to a great episode of How I Built This by Guy Raz. If anyone is a fan of that, it's a podcast where he talks to entrepreneurs. The episode that just dropped this week was about Goodreads. Really? And he interviewed Otis and Elizabeth Chandler. Goodreads was sold to Amazon in, I want to say like 2011 or something, 2012, but they stayed on until 2018. So they talk about the beginning times when he was young and trying to figure out some sort of tech world to create and decided to go with Goodreads. He even talks about how they got the name. I really enjoyed it. I'll put a link in the show notes. Oh, that's so cool. I definitely want to listen to that. I had an online adventure that I attended. It was through C19, which is the Society of 19th Century Americanists. They had this really cool event called First Book with a bunch of academics whose first book dealing with the 19th century was just published. 
You had to register. I'll see if there's a link where they have a replay. But everybody had a couple minutes to talk about their book and then talk about the publication of it and offer a bit of advice to people. And then there were some questions from the audience. I'm just going to read off real quick just the name and the title, and then we'll put all of these in the show notes. Ashley Barnes, Love and Depth in the American Novel from Stowe to James. Gordon Frazier, Star Territory, Printing the Universe in 19th Century America. Melissa Gnadek, Oceans at Home, Maritime and Domestic Fictions in 19th Century American Women's Writing. Reed Gotchberg, Museum Science and Literature in 19th Century America, which as somebody who's in library school right now, I definitely want to check out that one. It sounded fascinating. Thomas Konings, Founded in Fiction, The Uses of Fiction in the Early United States. Hannah Murray, Liminal Whiteness in Early U.S. Fiction. Zin Yao, Disaffected, The Cultural Politics of Unfeeling in 19th Century America. And then Alyssa Zellinger, Lyrical Strains, Liberalism and Women's Poetry in 19th Century America. And it was hosted by Crystal Doniker. So really fascinating to get just kind of an overview of that and just current trends in 19th century American studies. That sounds so cool. Well, I'm going to now hit you guys with even more books. <laughs> <laughs> when we used to go to Book Expo, one of the funnest events was the Buzz Books with editors where they would talk about the book that they had coming out that they were so excited about. Book Expo is not happening anymore, but the American Booksellers Association, in partnership with Publishers Lunch, put out a call saying we are going to be doing some of these through Zoom. So I signed up for one hosted by the author Emma Straub, who is also the owner of Books Are Magic in Brooklyn. What was cool about this one is they had both the editor and the author. They did a little breakout with them and they would talk to each other about the experience of editing the book together and what the book's about and how they came to write it and that sort of thing. So I'm just going to read these off and tell you their pub dates. Some of these aren't coming out for a little while, but you can always pre-order them or ask your library to get them. Blood Orange Night, My Journey to the Edge of Madness by Melissa Bond. This comes out June 14th. This is her memoir about addiction to benzodiazepines. Really intense story. A Tiny Upward Shove by Melissa Chadburn. This comes out on April 12th. This is a Filipino heritage and folklore novel. It traces cast-off women and uses the concept of Aswang, which is a shape-shifting evil creature. And then Brother Alive by Zane Kaleed. This comes out on 712, and this is about three adopted brothers who live above a mosque in Staten Island with their imam father in the 90s. With Prejudice by Robin Pagaro. This comes out May 17th. It's a debut high-stakes thriller about the murder of a beloved young woman and the racial prejudice that hangs over every trial in America. You can bet my hands are going to be on that one. Take My Hand by Dolan Perkins Valdez. This comes out on April 12th. She's the author of Wench, Mm. which a lot of people really liked. It's historical fiction inspired by the true events of a black nurse who found out that In post-segregation Alabama, young women were being sterilized without their knowledge. And then Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. This is out May 3rd. And they said this is for fans of A Man Called Oove, a charming, witty, and compulsively readable exploration of friendship, reckoning, and hope, tracing a widow's unlikely connection with a giant Pacific octopus. Yeah, this author said octopuses are kind of having their moment right now Mm because there's that documentary on Netflix that's really popular about a man who has an affinity for an octopus. Yeah, and there was another book out recently about an octopus and just how intelligent they are. Mm -hmm. Very. It was a great event. Emma Straub is funny, so, you know, every time they would come back to her and she had something witty to say because she's witty like that. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. And again, we will put all of those links to the books Chris mentioned and that I mentioned in the show notes for your reference. Yes. Yeah. So what about upcoming Biblio adventures? Is anything on your calendar? I have one and it's going to a bookstore that I have passed 
probably six times now, and I, it's never been open. Some of that was due to weather, but it's called the Next Chapter Bookstore in West Hartford. It's right in downtown West Hartford. It's a used bookstore, and it's staffed by students who have completed post-secondary, so they're 18 to 22, but it's vocational, so it's a way to train them how to learn to work and run a bookstore run a cash register, show up to work on time, that sort of thing. It's all selling donated books and hardcovers are $5, paperbacks are $2 and donations can be made through the American School for the Deaf. And I'll put a link in the show notes of how to reach out to them if you want to do any donating. I'm desperate to get in there. I have pulled on the door handle and it's, you know, not open. I think it's because it closes at five o'clock. You know, it's like one of those weekday businesses. So I'm going to report back once oh, I get in. Excellent. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to hear about that. Yeah. Maybe we can even go together. We'll that try would to be figure cool. it out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we'll go to lunch somewhere. Yeah. Okay. All right. right on. Joint job. It's warm enough lately. Like it's been in the forties, I think this week. So we can always just eat in the car or something if we have to. Well, and it's right across the street from the Noah Webster library. So we could also go eat over on the benches by Mr. Webster's statue. All right. So... How about any upcoming reads, Chris? Oh my gosh, I have an awesome one. I cannot wait to get into this. It is called Index, comma, A History of the. And the uh, <laughs> the subtitle is A Bookish Adventure from Medieval Manuscripts to the Digital Age. It's by Dennis Duncan. And this book comes out February 15th in the U.S. It came out in the fall, I believe, in the U.K. already. But it's all about the index. I love indexes, and I can't stand when a nonfiction book doesn't have an index. I I just think that's wrong. Yeah. So this book is all about the history of the index, which they've been around for about 800 years. I just can't wait to dig in. I wish you guys could see her face. She's so excited. She's like hugging this book. Yes, this book has been (laughs) on my reading table right next to me next to my reading chair so that is like my very 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 soon tbr pile and then i have you know 10 other piles scattered throughout (laughs) and and levels of um get to ness yes so yeah i'm super excited about this because i love indexes so much and they can really make or break a research project Mm -hmm. even books that i've read before I'll go back to it years later and look at the index to find out where something was and it's not in there. And it's just like, how can that not be in there? Mm. How can that not be in the index? What's cool about this is one of the current trends is to have computerized indexes. And this book has two indexes, one that was created by human and one that was created by a computer. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And with my interest in programming and Being in library school where databases and indexes are so important, I can't wait to dig into this. All right. So I have a burning question. Is it indexes or indices? Indexes. Indexes. I I don't know. I I was adding another. I don't know. I wasn't saying it's indexes. Indices is something I've seen. Yeah. Well, maybe after you read all the 300 pages, you'll report back. I will definitely report back. I mean, this this is written for a popular audience. So may you all find a copy if you're interested in it. And thank you to W.W. Norton for sending us a copy that we requested. Really appreciate that. Well, my upcoming read is probably also on your list, which is A Snake Falls to Earth by Darcy Little Badger. This is our next read along and the date is coming We're going to talk about this on the next episode that drops on March 1st, episode 150. Our Zoom chat is on February 27th, right around the corner. Yeah, Yeah, I'm excited. We've got some listeners who really loved it. Some have said it takes a little while to get into. There's a little bit of world building in it. We shall see. Yeah, and there's two Mm storylines, a girl and a snake. So yeah, yeah. looking forward to it. Things that people really love and things that some people may not like as much. So That'll be an interesting conversation to have with the group on Zoom. Yeah, my brain struggles with world building sometimes, so we'll see how it goes. I think Jenny was saying it'd be really nice if there was a character map, so I might go out on the interwebs and see if there's a character map. Oh, okay. That might be an interesting thing, too, to think about while we start reading it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is how would you map that out and structure 
a tree or a map. Yeah. Any of you, you know, PowerPoint aficionados, feel free. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll spread it. We'll spread the map around yeah. if you create it. Put your name on it. So coming up next is our conversation with author, podcaster, amazing human being, Bianca Murray. She has written the books, Hum If You Don't Know the Words. If You Want to Make God Laugh. Which we've talked about on this podcast. Yeah. She was a guest on a previous episode as well. She is a gift to the world and to the book community. We're so thrilled that she took the time to stop and talk to us about the Prin Viper, her new short story, Audible original, amongst many other things. Yes. So enjoy. We are so happy to be here today with Bianca Murray, who is the author of Hum, If You Don't Know the Words. And she was our guest on episode 65 to talk about that book, which was our ninth read along. And since then, she's also published another fantastic novel, If You Want to Make God Laugh. Bianca's here today to talk with us about her new short story that is an Audible original, and also a bit about her podcast that she has started since we spoke last time. Welcome back, Bianca. Thank you so much for having me. Always wonderful to chat to the two of you. So we wanted to start off by talking about The Prin Viper, which is your new Audible original short story. Chris and I were talking before we started chatting with you about this is going to be tricky to talk about because it's definitely high possibility for spoilers. So we thought maybe you'd be well practiced now at how to talk about what the story is about without giving too much away. You would think that, but you would be wrong. <laughs> um, here's, here's the thing about an Audible original is that people don't tend to reach out and ask you to chat to their book clubs about it, or you don't, you know, you obviously don't do book story events or anything. So this is the first time that I'm publicly speaking about the story, you know, I have been muttering darkly at some of the reviews that I've seen and, and the things some people have said. And I've been like, damn it, you missed the whole damn point of it. What is wrong with people? Why don't you have critical thinking skills? But this is the first time I'm speaking about it. So just to give the listeners an understanding of the premise, it is a dystopian world in the future, where once a woman gets pregnant, she goes on trial to defend the right to have her child. But in a twist, there are 13 jurors. Now, in most jury systems, the jurors are meant to be completely impartial. But in this jury system, the jurors are all completely partial because um, what happens in this world is that there's software called quasi-coso, um, a quantum science computational software that at this point in time is able to map out each person's life in complete detail. So who that child will go on to be, who their friends will be, who they'll get married to, the careers that they will follow, et cetera, et cetera. The software maps it out to the degree that they are able to say who will be detrimentally affected if this child is born and who will be positively affected if this child is born. So the woman goes on trial, uh, the jurors listen to Quasi Coso's projections and based on that, the jury then reaches a verdict as to whether the child can be born or not. Wow, that's a great summation. Thank you for that. And we're honored that we're the first to be talking with you about this story because we both loved it. And we were blown away by so many of the literary allusions in the story to classic stories like The Scarlet Letter, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Hester Prynne is the main character there, and a lot of other stories that came up along the way as well. And I wondered, how did you go about writing this story or conceptualizing this story? Did you have some of these classics in mind or... Were you going more from the artificial intelligence issue and, and the crises that we're facing today, like global warming? Yeah, you know, it was the weirdest way this story came to me, because as you both know, I do not write dystopian fiction, I don't write sci-fi, and I don't write short stories. Uh, and there's a good reason for that, because I'm extremely wordy. Um, there's nothing that can be said in a tiny sentence that I won't speak about for days and days. So I was listening to my husband having a conversation with the staff member because this was during the beginning of COVID and he was home and this woman was struggling very much to have a child. She'd gone for various in vitros and she was really upset that particular day 
And if you know my husband, you know he's not someone who's very good at giving emotional support to someone. He's the class clown. He's the guy who always tries to make jokes and lighten the mood and try and make people laugh. And even he was, you could just see, he was at a loss as to how to console her. And something he said really triggered it for me because, you know, I know so many women who have got to go for fertility treatment to have babies. And many of them, the fertility treatment doesn't work. And it's just soul destroying. And it often gets me thinking, you know, it's so unfair, this random way that the universe decides and other people will say it's God or whatever, that, you know, something gets to decide who has children, who doesn't. And, you know, I worked for 10 years in South Africa um, with a, a charity or a nonprofit organization that looked after abused abandoned and HIV positive children. So back then it was always on my mind that some people could easily have children, but they shouldn't have been allowed to have children. And then there are people who desperately want children and, and can't have them. So it really got the wheels spinning in terms of this, who gets to decide who has children and who doesn't. And suddenly this idea just clicked into place this concept occurred to me. And then, of course, I haven't written in the genre, so I had to do research on the genre and on this future that I envisioned. Um, and as I was writing, I was just trying to think of character names. And I was going, if we were in this future where books are no longer a thing, but people are always nostalgic for the past, cars are no longer a thing. I think one of the um, lawyers is called Buick Washington. You know, because his parents and whoever would have been nostalgic for a time when they owned a Buick, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, being a writer, I love any kind of literary illusions. So I named a whole bunch of characters after, you know, writers, et cetera, or, or characters in books. And certainly Hester Prynne um, came to mind because women's behavior, women's decisions, women's bodies, we've been judged for a very long time. Our bodies have been controlled, et cetera, et cetera. So she was front of mind when I wrote this. Uh, and so that's why I chose the, you know, the last name for my main character, Naomi. Ooh, yeah. yeah. One of my thoughts when I was listening was like, damn, it's so far into the future and women are still on trial. It doesn't seem to stop. I mean, just look at what's been happening in the last year in the U.S. in terms of overthrowing Roe versus Wade and things like that. And it feels to me that it doesn't matter where we are in history, People are always going to be trying to control women's bodies because, you know, they. the one thing that I said I was muttering darkly about some of my reviews, somebody wrote, this author clearly is anti-abortion and anti-vaccine and anti-masks because of the themes that are explored in this book. And it could not be further from the truth. I am completely pro-choice. But, you know, there is a very big difference between a woman desperately wanting to have a child and being forced to abort that child and a woman who is pregnant with a child she does not want to have and choosing to have an abortion. And I don't know, people seem to not be able to tell that that difference because in this story, you know, my main character desperately wants to have a child. This is her third or fourth time being on trial. And each time she was forced to abort the child that she was carrying, and she desperately wants this child. You know, there are things in the short story where uh, we look at, in the society, people are told, do what you should for the greater good. And then somebody said, I'm clearly an anti-vaxxer and an anti-masker. And I'm like, nobody has stayed home more than me. Honestly, my husband has a genetic condition uh, that predisposes him to blood clotting. And considering that COVID, you know, was killing people because of blood clots, we were staying home. We got our vaccines. We didn't go on vacation. We didn't see anybody because we were terrified of making other people ill. So we were those people that were really trying to do what we should for the greater good of other people. But like anything in history, any ideology, any good thing can be twisted and can be warped and corrupted. And so that's something that I was trying to explore as well. Like sometimes it's good to do something for the greater good, but who decides what the greater good is and how can they manipulate us and, and corrupt it, you know, based on, on that. And now I've gone so off topic that I have no idea what your question was. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's a really, you know, they're, they're looking at it and reviewing it in the moment, which, you know, people's viewpoints are heated right now. 
because this short story I thought was incredible. The pace was really quick. Longtime listeners know I love myself a courtroom drama, and this is purely courtroom drama. And I thought it was really brilliant how you placed it so far in the future. It really was. You could bring up so many different things that we're not familiar with. And I was wondering how much of that was done via research and how much was it you just gave yourself permission to just, you know, let your mind go wild? Yeah, it was a bit of both. Everything that I've written in the past has been greatly mired in reality. So I've written about apartheid South Africa and each time I had to do a lot of research about that era that I was writing in. So how many of you don't know the words? That was 1976. And if you want to make God laugh, it was like 1994 to 1996. So I had to make sure that everything there was factually correct, that the backdrop was faithfully represented, uh, that nothing there was incorrect. And suddenly I had the story whereby, you know, it was in the future and I could just play around with it. Um, and a lot of things, you know, I did research certain things. I'd get an idea about um, using tattoos to help regulate body temperature, things that are solar powered, etc. using nail varnish that helps act as, you know, when you hop on the subway, you just flash your nail varnish. Or when you pay at a store, instead of pulling out your credit card, your nail varnish um, gives all the information that these machines need. And then I was like, holy heck, that could lead to identity theft where people chop off people's fingers to use their nail varnish. And then how would they work around that? So definitely my writer's brain was having a lot of fun with, you know, how do I see this world looking? Like if we no longer have natural resources like trees and natural fibers, etc., if everything's made out of plastic, how will things be used in the future? Will they be printing things using 3D printers? You know, the, the whole story takes place within this day, you know, as, as the courtroom drama unfolds. And so all of that information just had to flesh out the story because the entire jury is sitting there to Quasicosa, they're listening to everything. So what I wrote about the clothes and the nail varnish and the tattoos and things were just like little observational things. But certainly this is a story that I think could be greatly expanded into a novel. And if I ever do get that chance, then it's something that I would have to put a lot more research into as I really think about this world. Yeah. And, you know, the story was really twisty and turny. But that's what I liked about the story was just when I thought I knew kind of what was going on, because in the beginning, you don't really know what's going on. I would start to kind of get my pacing and then something would happen. And I'd be like, oh, wow, OK, this is a different thing completely than what I thought it was. That happened a couple times. And I really enjoyed the story so much for that. You know, you're known for having wonderful, heartfelt humor in your stories. And I thought there was some humor in this one as well, even though it's kind of dystopian. Yeah, th thank you very much for that. Yeah, there's there's some fart jokes, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I channeled my in your ten year old boy um, and and had some fart jokes, you know, because uh, anything, I, you know, I hate writing that gets classified as kind of trauma porn. You know, trauma for the sake of trauma and just compounded hardship on top of hardship. Um, because life is not like that. Even in the worst moments, even in the most bleak moments, our coping mechanism as human beings is humor. You know, that's that's how we deal with things. And so that's something I always try and incorporate into my books. In fact, the, the next book that I've written is, um, again, a complete genre change for me. It's contemporary fantasy. It has uh, six witches who are in their 80s who are bringing down the patriarchy, having the best sex of their lives. They run a distillery. It's just wild. And that book is the one book that I've really completely and utterly leaned into the, the humor writing that I love that I love doing. But certainly, even in this dark, dystopian kind of tale, there were a few moments of levity. And I was very lucky in that Audible allowed me to listen to everybody who was auditioning for each role. And I had it very clearly in my mind how each character should sound. I think the auditioning for Matthias was the hardest because he's a hundred and something years old, Latinx, 
uh, person. And so, you know, that was kind of difficult to, to get that voice right. But I think his performance was excellent. I think the whole cast of performance was really excellent. And then I wanted kind of like a radio play quality to it, you know, with the sound of the gavel and the murmurs in the gallery and things like that. And I asked if I could do that and they said, absolutely. So it was, it was really wonderful to, to really bring it alive alive that way. Yeah. So that was one of our questions. Did you know that, did you know who the cast was as you were writing? Is that what you were saying? I mean, you knew that this was going to be audible only, right? So how did it change your writing process in general? It's very different to write for an audiobook than what it is for writing, you know, for something in print. And if you listen to a lot of audiobooks, there'll be times when you get quite annoyed when you're listening to the audiobook because they go, he said, she said, he said, she said. Meantime, the voice actor changes their voice when they are doing the voices of other characters. So you don't need all the he said and she said because you, you can figure that out for yourself. So I didn't know who the voice actors were going to be when I wrote, but certainly I was much more cognizant of knowing that a voice actor would change their voice and that, you know, I shouldn't put all the he saids and she saids, etc. So I did have to write it very differently. But when it was finished and the time came to cast it, by then I knew exactly how these voices were in my head. And I worked with their director, which was really useful because there are five narrators in total. One is the computational software, Quasi Coso, and the other four are members of, uh, three are members of the jury. One is the defendant, um, Naomi Prin. And when that Naomi Prin voice actor is putting on the voice of, you know, Deborah, who's juror 11, she has to use that same accent that juror 11 has, which is a kind of British accent. And when somebody else is doing Matthias, they have to put on, you know, that sort of Latinx accent. So it was quite difficult for us to sit and figure it out. And we had to send each voice actor the other voice actors auditions so that they knew what kind of accents to put on. So they did say it was one of the more technically difficult productions that they had to do. But I think, you know, the voice actors did an amazing job. The director did an, an amazing job. And I worked closely with the editor there, uh, Jessica, who when I was writing things in a way that was more like a book as opposed to an audible original, you know, she would cross things out and say, keep in mind that when the actors perform X, Y, and Z. So it was a lovely learning curve for me to do something very, very different. Oh, that's so fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. So from the time you had this idea, when you were listening to your husband talk, did you start writing it as a story to begin with? Or did you immediately think like, oh, this could be an audio story? How did that come about? So my first editor at Putnam, uh, Kerry Colin, I call her my uh, literary fairy godmother, because after a hundred rejections for Hum If You Don't Know the Words, she was the one editor who picked it up and who loved it and who bought it. And that's why on my podcast, I always say it just takes one yes, mm -hmm. because after a hundred rejections, I thought it was never going to be published. And um, she loved it. And then she bought, uh, if you want to make God laugh, based on three chapters and a synopsis. She didn't get to edit that book because she then moved on from there and she ended up at Audible. And her and I had chatted and she said to me, if you ever have an idea for a short story, let me know. And I said, it's very unlikely because I don't do short stories. And then, of course, when I had that idea, I sketched it out, just um, an overview of what I thought the story would be, a bit of a synopsis, and I messaged her. It was 2020, just before the end of the year. Uh, I messaged her and I said, I have this idea. What do you think? And she said, I absolutely love it. We're buying it. Write the story. And then again, she ended up leaving before she was actually able to edit it. So I worked with somebody else. And it was supposed to originally come out in the July of last year. But they were hoping to get a well-known actress to play the role of uh, Naomi Prin. Because I don't know if you noticed, but during COVID, there were suddenly tons of celebrities doing audiobooks because they were stuck at home and they weren't able to do anything else. Uh, and they were really hopeful of getting a sort of big name as one of the narrators. Uh, and then it got pushed out again to October and it kept getting pushed out. 
And they unfortunately weren't able to get somebody to do that. And then that's how it's sort of released now. So it, it took quite a while to come out, but I think it took me two weeks to write that story. And it, it's a technical story. Like you said, there's lots of twists and turns and we're dealing with the software that knows things about people. So if X happens, why does it allow Y to happen? And my brain was hurting with trying to sit down and <laughs> brainstorm all the repercussions of this. And if this happened in the past, how does this affect the future? So, um, but yeah, it, I wrote it extremely, extremely quickly and it turned out to be 16,000 words, which is almost quarter of a novel. Oh, no, it didn't, it didn't feel that long when I no. was listening. And the performance is really great. It really is truly a performance. So kudos to you for getting all of that done. Yeah, thank you. People often say, are you going to narrate your audio books? And I always say, hell no, because <laughs> it's, you know, these are professional actors and there's a reason for that. They know what the hell they're doing. So I'll write and, and they can do the performances. Yes. You mentioned your podcast a couple sentences ago, and we would love to talk with you about that. This is a project that you've started since we spoke last time, The Shit No One Tells You About Writing, which I thought was funny as hell when I first heard it and you first started it. I know that you've recently rebranded with a new logo. Tell us about your podcast. Yeah, so in 2020... When uh, it was the summer of 2020, everything was shut down. We were supposed to be traveling. We weren't traveling. Uh, I was getting a whole bunch of people reaching out and asking me for advice about writing or publishing, etc. And I was teaching a lot through the University of Toronto at that time. And I found myself saying the same things kind of over and over to the point that I would send someone advice and actually copy and paste what I sent and save it because I knew in two days somebody else would reach out and ask for the same thing and I'd kind of use it and tweak it, etc. So I was going, how can I reach more people, you know, with this advice? Because I am a creative writing instructor and I've learned a ton of things the hard way, you know, through publishing myself. There were so many things that when I published my first novel that I didn't know, didn't know how to navigate any of this and, you know, learned the hard way by doing it. And so I thought, okay, let me start this podcast, which is exactly the shit no one tells you about writing. I got a friend to do my logo. It was a funny little toilet paper logo because, you know, that's my sense of humor. And I started the podcast and I said to myself, oh, if we get 100 listeners, that'll be great. And then it suddenly started picking up steam. And then I interviewed two agents on the podcast, Carly Waters from PS Literary and Cece Lira from PS Literary. I interviewed them for completely separate things. And people really loved those episodes. And one day I thought to myself, wouldn't it be interesting if we took those query letters that authors send out? Because that is the hardest part of getting published is getting an agent. It is so, so difficult. And you can write this 80,000 word manuscript, but to write a one page query letter is so difficult because you have to tell, you have to sell yourself, you have to sell the novel. And those first five pages that an agent reads is again, really critical. So I thought, how about we get some people to submit their query letters in their first five pages and we get Carly and Cece to just give them some advice. And so they just started off as guests on the podcast. And of course that took off. People absolutely loved it because it's so helpful. And we do different genres and we'll do memoir and fantasy and all kinds of things. And, you know, based on the feedback we've given people, some people have gone on to get their agents because they've revised based on the advice we gave them. And so Carly and Cece very kindly agreed to come on as co-hosts. And yeah, we are now heading towards half a million downloads. You know, we sort of have 8,000 downloads per episode, which is absolutely amazing. And it's just, it's taken off. So we, we're going to do some merchandising. And I figured people don't want to have toilet paper on their t-shirts <laughs> and on their caps. Although some people have told us they do want the toilet paper. So we might, you know, for the nostalgic ones, give them some toilet paper. So we've had a rebrand. Um, and we've just finished our first virtual retreat, which was amazing. So we got like, people at the top of the game in terms of teaching the craft of writing. We got uh, Lisa Cron, who wrote Story Genius and Wired for Story. Jessica Brody, who wrote Saves the Cat, writes a novel. Courtney Mom, who wrote Before and After the Book Deal. Um, she's also got a ton of other fiction titles out. 
and Valerie Francis, who teaches the story grid method. And then we got Britt Bennett as well, because we had a meeting and we said, who is the coolest, most wow author we can think of? And we were like, Britt Bennett. And it all came together and we had like 150 writers from all over the world attending the virtual retreat. And it was just amazing. It gives people a sense of community while they're learning at the same time. And they now have beta readers and other people to reach out to. And yeah, it's just, it's really taken off and it's been wonderful. It's incredibly rewarding. That's just so great, Bianca. I mean, one of the words that I hear a lot right now during the pandemic is connection. People are looking for connection and it's just increasingly more difficult, but you've created an amazing community with people and authors and wannabes connecting with each other. Yeah, you know, any community is only as good as the members of it, you know. So I I gave people an opportunity to sort of come together. Uh, and they're the ones who've, who've really just created this amazing, amazing space. Like last year, I uh, put together 900 writers, sorted them into writing groups. And I tell people I'm still going to therapy after that because it was quite, a, <laughs> quite an endeavor, um, taking into account time zones and genres and do you want to work with other LGBTQ writers or do you want to work with other diverse writers? So uh, these spreadsheets, thank goodness my husband's in banking because he helped me with all these multiple spreadsheets <laughs> to try and get people um, sorted. And that's been hugely rewarding because, you know, people now have – writing groups and they have other people to speak to because writing can feel so lonely. You know, we sit in our little rooms and we make shit up and we talk to our imaginary friends. Um, but, you know, the rejection when you go out and try and get an agent, it's, it's huge. And writers are sensitive people. You have to be sensitive to be a good writer. But then being that sensitive can count against you when you get all these no's and all of these rejections and things like that. So my writing groups have been the greatest gift I've had on my writing journey. And I certainly wanted other writers to experience the same. And you know what, like, I would say 90% of people are just wonderful. They just Oh, thank you. I mean, because this is not something people paid for. Registered, and I said, please do not register unless you are 100% serious about being in a writing group because it's not fair to other people for me to sort you, and then you drop out and leave them hanging. I even made them tick this disclaimer that they are 100% serious about it. And then I would sort people into these writing groups, and I'd hear two weeks later that two people in the group have now dropped out. Can they now be in another writing group? But of course, another writing group is already established and you can't put new people in an established group, etc. So, you know, it's human nature to focus on the negative and the people who are driving you a little bit cray cray in terms of uh, managing all of that. But most people were, you know, they loved their groups. They were grateful. They dived right in and, and they made the absolute best of it. But yes, I'm building up the stamina for the next round. <laughs> That's great. That's a beautiful thing that you did. You know, listening to the podcast too, I would say even if people aren't interested in writing, they should definitely give it a listen because having the agents read those query letters, you learn so much about genre. Like what is this genre? You know, the, the most recent episode, somebody kind of miss genre themselves you know, and that's interesting, too, from a reader standpoint, when you do think about books and stories and what is categorized as what, and is that appropriate or did somebody miss the mark? And just how to develop a story, like where the story actually is, like what turns an agent on about a story versus what the writer thinks is the main heart of it, you know? Yeah, very, very much so. And, you know, so I've found that um, readers... Even if they're not writers, they kind of fall into two categories. They're the kind of readers who are really analytical and they want to understand the mechanics of a story, what, what makes a good story. Because if you're able to do that, you become a much better reviewer. You know, you're able to say not just I enjoyed the story, it was good, but like I enjoyed it, it was good because of X, Y, and Z, the way the author did this, etc., etc. And then you have other readers who just want the magic of it. They don't want the curtain to be lifted. And so, you know, they, they, they don't want to see that. But for people who are readers who don't want that, the second part of every episode is always an author interview. You know, we've had authors across all genres. We've had some amazing authors that I've gotten to to speak to on the podcast. And that's always incredibly, incredibly interesting as well. 
Yeah, you've had a lot of great authors. People should definitely check out. You're, you're in, I think, like the 90th episode, right? So there's plenty to listen to. I think so. I think we're like at 8.9 and in the, um, season eight, episode nine. And then we've had a ton of bonus episodes as well. Like today we had a bonus episode with two authors on as opposed to having a, a books with hooks. It was just two genre authors that we... Um, you know, that I got that I got to chat to. And that was lovely, too. So Bianca, are we allowed to ask you a little bit about this book about witches and when we might see it? <laughs> I am so excited about this book. I am bouncing off the walls to talk about this book. It's supposed to be coming out for Halloween. And it is like it is such a joyous romp of a book. So I was reading The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Clune during COVID. And that book was just like a big warm hug. It just, you know, at that point, like everybody else, my brain was fried. There was only so much I was able to to kind of take on. And so I wanted to write the kind of book that would feel to me like a big hug. But at the same time, I am a writer and I was filled with such rage about what had been happening in the world, how feminism has been set back so far by COVID with all these mothers having to give up their full-time jobs to homeschool children, et cetera, and just reading all of the stuff. Again, that women are the ones who take the brunt of all of these things. You know, and this is something that I saw in South Africa playing out as well, that women are the ones left with the babies and women are the ones who who always have to make the biggest sacrifices. And so I wanted to write a warm, cozy hug of a book, but of course I did have all of this rage that I needed to work through. And so, you know, you have these six witches, like I say, in their 80s, they all live together in a huge, creepy old mansion called Moonshine Manor, Moonshine with a Y. They run their own distillery in this town of Critchley Hackle, And, you know, as witches have experienced for decades, they're, you know, constantly at the mercy of the townsmen who are constantly coming with pitchforks to get rid of them. And I wanted to play around with generations as well. So we have a 15-year-old young girl who's an avid TikToker. Uh, (laughs) Her name is Persephone. And, of course, you know, you have this generational divide. You have this youngster who's really politically correct who, um, you know, tells the one which she can't call other witches, you know, her bitches, um, and who's like <laughs> trying to school her on feminism. And you have this eight-year-old woman who's not having it. Um, so there's a lot of, I mean, we have a um, little Italian greyhound called Ruth Bader Ginsburg who wears the collar. Um, it's just a delightful book. There's a witch heist in it, a magical heist, uh, and all kinds of things. And it was just a so much fun for me to write. It took me out of a lot of COVID. Uh, and I'm hoping that, you know, when it does come out, it's going to be um, a lot of fun for, you know, my readers, hopefully a new audience as well, um, you know, because it's very different to what I what I have been writing. But as per my books, there are deeper themes, you know, there's some heartwarming themes in it. And there's a lot for people to think about um, in terms of identity, uh, in terms of what makes us who we are and friendship and and sisterhood, very much so. Oh, sounds great. I can't wait. I cannot wait. Well, Bianca, thank you so much for taking the time to come chat with us today. We love you so much. I love you both too. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again in two weeks with another episode. Until then, come chat with us on social media. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter, we would love to have you join our community. All of the books that we talked about in this episode are listed in the show notes, which you can find at bookcougars.com. Each book will link to our bookshop.org page where your purchase will help support not only the book cougars, but also independent bookstores everywhere. And if you're an audiobook listener, we do have a special offer from libro.fm. You can find all of this information on our website. Again, that's bookcougars.com. Thanks, everybody. This episode is edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.